Good morning, viewers and listeners. Welcome back to the latest episode of Free Marketeers. Thank you very much for being with me again today. On uh, today, the 31st of May, World No Tobacco Day. I hope you're all ready for tomorrow, the 1st of June, for the freedoms that come with lockdown level three here in South Africa. I hope you're ready to enjoy all the freedom that comes with moving to a new lockdown level. But for today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about World No Tobacco Day. I'm joined by the CEO of the Free Market Foundation, Leon Lowe. Leon, thank you for being here. Yes, it's good to be with you, and uh, I'm very happy to discuss what I call World No Freedom Day. Uh, it's not about no tobacco at all, um, it's about freedom. I'm glad you touch on, on that uh, aspect of philosophy, a bit more abstract thinking. I mean, so the World Health Organization, you know, it's fair enough for, for a private organization like that to advise that people should quit smoking kind of thing. But for me, the, the important thing comes in when governments follow the recommendations of the WHO and start to impact the decisions of their people's lives, where they decide what people can smoke, what they can consume, all that sort of stuff. So maybe just broadly, could you start off by talking a bit about the sort of the ideas behind World No Tobacco Day, or as you say, World No Freedom Day? Yeah, let's be very clear about a few things, and I, I shouldn't need to say this, but I'm going to. I'm a lifelong non-smoker, and I don't like tobacco or smoking. Uh, I'm also a teetotal and I don't have sugar and I don't have salt and I don't do use junk food and refined foods and I'm a, I'm a model healthy lifestyle person which the, and I exercise regularly and the World Health Organization should use me as its poster boy. Uh, now having said that, I'm absolutely in favor of somebody who wants to be obese or wants to be sedentary or wants to have lots of salt or wants to have refined food or junk food or fast food or liquor or tobacco or someone who wants to jump off a cliff. I'm mm -hmm. all in favor of the right to do so. And uh, for anyone out there who's a fellow non-smoker who says, yes, but we need protection from smokers, mm -hmm. let me say that is about as stupid a thing as anybody can say. You need protection from people who swing their fist around in the air, i.e. they're free to do it, but not where your nose is. Mm -hmm. That people should be free to blow their smoke into the air, but not where your nose is. Mm -hmm. In other words, to protect you from someone else's smoke has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with their lifestyle choice, mm -hmm. whether they should smoke or whether they should drink. If they drink and drive drunk and crash into you, yes, that's a problem. But if they drink and get drunk and pass out or whatever they do, that's not your problem. So as long as they, and if they're obese, uh, they're very unhealthy. Obese people uh, are uh, morbidly obese people are at greater health risk, for, for example, than smokers and drinkers. Mm. Uh, they uh, impose enormous costs on the so called public health system. Unlike smokers and drinkers, they don't pay for themselves through excise duty and tax. In other words, they really are a burden on society. Mm. Uh, smokers, if all the rhetoric of the World Health Organization is true, uh, and a lot of it can be questioned, as I hope we will during this discussion, uh, then we should be thankful to smokers twice over. Firstly, they pay an enormous amount of tax and subsidize people like me, non-smokers, but they also do it by dying sooner, so they consume less pensions and less welfare and less uh, health care in elder life, so I save twice over thanks to smokers. If it's true that they do die younger, right. now, that can be discussed. But, but the Leon, point is, non-smokers like me should thank smokers every day for the fact that they're smokers. I think, what about, let me play devil's advocate for a bit here, Leon. Um, you know, let's say there's the science behind the negative effects of smoking and tobacco and that sort of thing. Maybe for, you know, for people, if you can find it for vaping as well. Shouldn't uh, the government have that, I guess, reach or control to decide for us if we can't make the decisions for ourselves? Well, uh, then I want to know on what account should the government not equally be entitled to require you to use a condom during sex mm -hmm. that should be made compulsory or that it should be compulsory for you to exercise every day. And by the way, these nicotine Nazis are the types of people who think government should do that sort of thing, right. should require people to lose weight and live healthy lifestyles and exercise regularly and get enough sleep and all sorts of other stuff that's worse for your health than the World Health Organization says tobacco is. But the World Health Organization also says things which people, including itself, tend to forget. 
namely that there are benefits to smoking, mm -hmm. very substantial benefits. Now, I know that people will hear that and think, really? Because they've heard the cliche, the mantra, over and over again that smoking has no benefits. Mm -hmm. Well, that is clearly nonsense. And you don't have to be, you know, if you, if you use your other synapse, if you're lucky enough to, to then you will immediately realize that the benefits are very conspicuous and obvious. Uh, they are, for example, as the World Health Organization says, people smoke to combat depression. They combat eating and drinking disorders. They combat obesity. They combat lack of concentration. They combat being fatigued while driving long distances. It, it, it helps people to relax, deal with stress, deal with socially lacking confidence, and just simply enjoying themselves, satisfaction. The greatest human right, in my view, is to be satisfied. Well, I don't know. I, don't, I think I think pleasure should be outlawed. I don't know, Leon. I don't know if you can risk uh, giving people freedom to enjoy <laughs> themselves. Well, you joke and smile, but <laughs> you must realize that this is in fact what oh. really is behind a whole lot of these anti-tobacco fanatics. Mm -hmm. These nicotine Nazis hate the thought mm -hmm. that somewhere someone is happy. They can't stand that thought. They would like everybody to be as miserable as they are. Mm -hmm. And they are miserable. These, these anti-smoking fanatics these Nico Nazis, nicotine Nazis, are miserable people. Mm. And they want everyone else to be miserable. They often reform smokers who long for their puff. They often reform drinkers who long for their drink. They are typically very unhealthy people themselves. And uh, although we shouldn't generalize that much, the people who smoke uh, tend to be a certain personality type. So that's another important point. I don't know whether you do or don't smoke, but let me just make an important issue here. Whether or not smoking is good or bad for you on balance depends on you. You cannot generalize about that. It's not one size fits all. It depends on your personality, your lifestyle, your, your inclination to overeat, for example. And if smoking helps you con control that, then it is physically healthy. It makes you a healthier body, let alone a healthier mind. Smoking definitely gives you a healthier mind for people who do smoke and who want to or enjoy it or need it. Uh, and the World Health Organization acknowledges that. But what it then says is, oh, there are better ways of achieving it. Oh, right. see. So, uh, so what? Then encourage people to do it. If there are better ways of achieving good health than being obese, you see, you could say I'm morbidly obese. That renders me physically probably not necessarily less healthy. Uh, and so what you do is you say to the person, well, lose weight. Well, how do you lose weight? Well, just stop eating. You know? <laughs> That's not nice if you don't enjoy it. Well, then stop eating things that are bad for you or give you make a, you know, in other words, what you do is you come up with the formula. Uh, which achieves the objective of smoking or drinking or eating or being obese or having sex without a condom or driving a car, which is much more dangerous, of course, or getting TB. Uh, there, are all sorts of, there are all sorts of transmitted diseases uh, which can be combated you know, much more easily. And so these are greater risks. And this fanaticism about smoking, is a Puritan uh, uh, disrespect for human dignity and human freedom. It's a disrespect for other people to control their lifestyle. Uh, you might as well say people may not have uh, homosexual uh, preferences. Mm. They may not be gay or lesbian. Uh, you know, ban it. Because you might say, you know, being gay increases your risk of getting AIDS, for example. Uh, or you might say being promiscuous does, or whatever it is. So oh, any of those memes effective. and motifs going around? Yeah, the government should stop telling people how to live. Mm. Our constitution says everyone has the right to freedom, to bodily control, to human dignity, uh, to, to a health, to a healthy life, freedom of choice. Uh, well, respect that. Uh, and these anti-smokers, no tobacco, okay, now, if they said, this is the day on which you encourage people not to smoke, mm. that you could have a world condom day mm. and say, this is the day on which we encourage people to use condoms, <laughs> that would be as logical. But you don't go around asking the government to make it compulsory. That is when you have crossed the line 
from being a decent, respectful human being to being uh, a, a totalitarian Nazi or communist. Now, Leon, touching on the constitution, I'm glad you mentioned the South African constitution. From tomorrow, the 1st of June, South Africans will be able to buy alcohol um, within certain hours. I think it was from Monday to Thursday, as the minister announced. Um, but tobacco sales are still prohibited. Now, of course, as we know, when government prohibits the sale of something, uh, people won't be able to access it. But, you know, I'm making a facetious point there. What is your take, uh, you know, on, on South Africa's approach throughout the pandemic from the beginning of the lockdown until now? Now we're allowing alcohol sales, but tobacco sales are still prohibited. We sent out a, a statement from you last week that the viewers and the listeners can find on our website, just as a reminder. But I thought you could talk a little bit about that aspect. Yes. Well, firstly, before we move of liquor, uh, this business of when you buy the liquor, somehow right. you know, the government has a very close connection with the virus, mm -hmm. with COVID virus. They apparently consulted and they said to it, look, please, if the people buy liquor during these hours, don't infect them. But if they buy liquor during other hours, then do infect them. And the virus is apparently very cooperative and listens to our government. Our I'm government. glad our government has had much control. I mean, yeah, I think we should be quite that, happy. Yeah. Uh, no, no one else in the world has ever managed to speak to a virus, but our government has briefed it on who it may and may not infect. Uh, and when it comes to smoking, they've, they've got a really amazing relationship with the virus. And mm -hmm. they said, look, if people bought the cigarettes before the lockdown, please don't infect them. Yes. If they bought the cigarettes on the uh, illegal illicit market after the lockdown, then they're easy meat. Go for them. Then you can infect them. Now, how stupid can you get? I'm afraid I can't be polite about politicians who oh. make such big laws. It is not, it is, they are not worthy of, of respect and dignity for such stupidity. It is not a law against smoking. It's a law against smoking new cigarettes. Right. Now, you ask about the illicit market. Let's just consider that. At the moment, it's considered to be about a third mm -hmm. before lockdown. About a third of all one in three cigarettes, roughly, have been illegal contraband. Why? Because the government imposes such heavy taxes and such restrictions on lawful cigarettes that the underground economy can flourish. Mm -hmm. And it does because it sells cigarettes without paying excise duty, import duty, taxes, uh, and, and you know other restrictions on marketing and so on. Um, so now what the government has done, and you know, there are all sorts of conspiracy theories. I don't agree with them, but it's worth mentioning. People say, oh, it's quite simple why they're doing this with tobacco, because they are on the take. They're involved with this underground economy. They're getting money from it. They're, and there are all sorts of rumors as to people right. as if it's connected people. So this is a way of promoting their interests. Mm. I'm not saying that I agree with that. I'm saying that that's a, a theory or a conspiracy theory that necessarily arises mm -hmm. when something so devoid of logic happens. So yes. it's completely idiotic happens. No, no, people start says, reaching. No. Yeah, well, what happens is you say, well, what could explain something so mindless, so mm -hmm. idiotic? Uh, well, there must be something. Maybe they're on the tech. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're just puritanical despots. Maybe they're intoxicated with the power that allows them to do this, uh, which the disaster management law might or might not do. That's also unclear. Right. Uh, and I think you've done uh, podcasts on this, mm. but nonetheless, uh, this idea that they can go around making laws depending on how they feel at three o'clock in the afternoon, with no discussion, no debate, no cross-benefit analysis, no socio-economic impact analysis, no portfolio committee hearings, no published notices, no calling for submission, none of the things that normally go into making a law. Right. This is a minister, uh, you know, uh, sipping a cup of tea, who has a, an idea and says, well, let me just declare this to be the law. So they are intoxicated with power or they've been smoking something for which they don't have a receipt. I think there was a lot of goodwill and understanding, at least, of the lockdown measures at the beginning. This global virus sweeping the world. Um, killing many people, but I think the government through these arbitrary and irrational regulations has simply, uh, I don't know, they've thrown all of that goodwill out the window. Yes, let's, let's just, uh, that is an important thing. I'm just turning my volume off. Uh, oh, it is off. Okay. Um, but, um, 
uh, it, that is an important thing to get. The goodwill which there was, and there was a lot. Uh, even I thought, you know, this makes some kind of sense. Knock this thing on the head. I, I mean, I was against the draconian law. I was in favor of something very simple, mm -hmm. which is the police and the army should be out there being a police service. Remember, right. it's called the South African Police Service. In the apartheid years, it was called the South African Police Force. And the idea was that it had to stop being a force imposing stupid laws like apartheid laws, it is right back to what it was under apartheid. It now goes around forcing people to do stupid things. And uh, so it, if it were really a service, what it would do is it would go around and explain to people, the army, the, the police, they would go around explaining to people what the risks are, how to be safe, handing out masks, handing out gloves, handing out sanitizer, uh, explaining social distancing, that would be a service. Right. It would be effective and it would work. What they have done now is the opposite. And let me say that we're talking about tobacco here. I have been a defender of the right to smoke as I'm a defender of the right to do uh, anything that is a personal lifestyle choice uh, for many years. That has made me very controversial. I have had most, almost uniform opposition from journalists, from members of the public. Even smokers have said to me, no, no, you can't defend smoking. Smoking is wrong. I really want to give it up. I'm trying. I can't. I keep going back, whatever. So there was uniform opposition to smoking and uniform opposition to me defending smoking. That has changed dramatically in a month. I cannot believe it. I, media, journalists, TV hosts, people who call me, uh, people who used to oppose me on this issue, uh, are suddenly saying this is wrong. This anti-smoking, neco-Nazi mindset, uh, clinical despotism is wrong, and human dignity and freedom of choice and lifestyle should be respected. So in a strange way, this lockdown, this, this, this attack on smoking and smokers, by the way, they do not attack tobacco. Right. You have not seen an inspector chasing a cigarette down the road. Okay, the tobacco doesn't do stuff that needs to be that needs to be. Uh, oh dear, what can I do? Here? Sorry about this. No problem. Um, that, as it happens, is the media calling for an interview. I think on this very issue. Um, so just as well. But anyway, uh, you, you do not control tobacco. Mm. You do not control cigarettes. You do not tax cigarettes. All controls are people controlled. Yes. You must understand they control people, not cigarettes. They control behavior. They control choice. They control lifestyle. Now, if we stopped calling it tobacco controls and started calling it people controls, which mm -hmm. is what it is, it might be less popular and mm -hmm. people might realize what they're doing and what the implications are. And... Um, so there is no such thing as world no tobacco day. Tobacco is a plant. There is such a thing as world no freedom day. We need to understand that these are people who are against my freedom as a lifelong non-smoker to smoke if I want to. They oppose that. They do not believe I should have that liberty. Who the hell are they? How dare they? That is arrogant, presumptuous, and obnoxious. For somebody to think they have the right to interfere with how I live my life, whether or not it's healthy. Now, Leon, um, I suppose it's the, the pandemic has justified, at least for government in their eyes, ostensibly what they've said is the health risks from smoking. So they've said that COVID-19, you know, it attacks the respiratory system. So therefore, we should we should uh, ban smoking, the sale of tobacco. We're well, not ban smoking. We should ban the sale of tobacco because then there's a, le a lower chance that people are going to smoke and expose their lungs, uh, weaken their lungs, the disease more. But I suppose by that logic, they should just indefinitely ban tobacco, and then they will have justified that. It doesn't even matter if it's COVID nineteen or not. Yeah, if it is a COVID nineteen measure, which of course is the rhetoric, but there's yes. no science to support it then we must understand what makes your lungs vulnerable to, as a smoker is long-term behavior. Right. Stopping smoking for a week or two or three doesn't change any uh, risk of being infected. On the contrary, there are studies to the effect 
that uh, if you're a smoker, you're less likely to be infected by COVID. It reduces the likelihood of infection. It also, the science seems to suggest that if you are a smoker and you get it, you are more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's subtle. You've got to understand you're yes. less likely to get it, but if you do, it's worse. Mm -hmm. So that's what it says. Now, the degree to which you're less likely and the degree to which it's worse is simply not known. There's, there's no science. It's not known. It's, right. uh, it's, uh, it's guesswork at this stage. It's speculative. It's early data. They do not have any science at all to support the notion that a long-term smoker who's deprived of smoking for two or three weeks or forced to buy tobacco on the illicit market is less vulnerable, mm -hmm. less likely to get... get it, it, you know, they, they have no evidence for that. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's what they say, but it's twaddle. It's the tyranny of twaddle. Mm -hmm. And they, you cannot be more polite about it. It's not subject to informed or intelligent discourse or debate. Uh, so we need to be very, very unrestrained in our condemnation of this sort of nonsense. And it is plain, simple nonsense. Now, what you do if you want people to be less likely to get uh, COVID is you have healthy behavior, right. social distancing. Mm -hmm. Don't blow your smoke into other people's face. Uh, if you do smoke, no, let me just make this point. If you deprive a smoker, and they say, I don't, they say smoking is, a, is, a, is an addiction, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's assume it is an addiction. And by standard definition, it's a habit, not an addiction. But right. Anyway, let's call it an addiction. Let's give them that. If you deprive a person overnight of their addiction, of the thing that they fix, what you do is you plunge them into an emotional and psychological crisis. Mm -hmm. You make them more likely to do wife and child abuse. You make them less, more stressed. You, they sleep deprived. They, if they do it, but what they then do uh, is they go and find a way of getting it on the illegal market. Now, I know, I think we all know people, uh, when I saw somebody, uh, you know, very conservative people over here where I am, smoking, I said, where did you get them? And they put their finger up to their lips and they say, don't ask. So they're getting it. Now, yep. the problem is this. They are paying two, three, four, five times more. Mm -hmm. So what the government has done to low income and poor smokers, who are the majority, what they have now forced them to do is to divert money they could be spending on healthy lifestyle, buying fruit and vegetables, uh, buying food, uh, buying blankets for their children as winter approaches, uh, uh, you know, getting, going and seeing doctors. If the government allows us to buy blankets, I'll just get that little dig in. But the point is that what you do is you get poor people to spend what little they have on their tobacco mm -hmm. instead of what little they have on housing improvement or safe water or uh, uh, you know um, hygiene or dishwasher or something like that, wash, anything, mm -hmm. uh, but particularly food. So you divert money from healthy food into cheap, rubbishy food in order for people to get their tobacco fixed. This is completely the worst thing you can do if you want to promote health during the COVID pandemic. They are doing precisely the opposite. If the devil came to the South African government and they said to the devil, you know, what would you like us to do to make South Africans as unhealthy as possible? This is what the devil would recommend. And I, my conspiracy theory is they have been recommended by the devil uh, to do this. And the devil and the South African government and the COVID virus met in secret and plotted all of this together. Uh, Leon, I think you've given me a lot to think about. I'm hoping the viewers and the listeners as well. But just I want to put you a little bit on the spot there and ask you for a little bit of forecasting maybe. Um, if you could just give maybe those amongst us, you know, who really want to get that nicotine fix in a, in the in the legal way, what do you what do you foresee going forward? Do you think government will buckle at some point? Do you think they're just going to double down? What? How do you see this all playing out over the next few stages? Because as we know, from the first of June, we're on level three. Um, I don't know at what point they're going to allow the sale of tobacco. Maybe level zero. Who knows if we ever eliminate the virus? We're not like New Zealand, an island that can just restrict all travel. But what do you think going forward? Do you foresee, you know, anything like that happening? Any radical change anytime soon? Just to uh, just as a final thought. 
Yes, uh, I, I think that uh, firstly around the world virtually no country has done this. Right. So we must understand they are completely out of step. No one in the world other than our government and one or two others out of the world's 220 countries thinks that banning tobacco products or banning smoking is a way to combat COVID. So mm -hmm. where they got this from, as I say, it's what on earth have they been smoking? Mm -hmm. And uh, so the other one is that will they change it? When will it go? Uh, the point about it is that the prohibition is so idiotic, mm -hmm. so stupid, that there's no, uh, you cannot think of anything logical. You can't think what, when will be the sensible time? Right. When might they do it? Because you're making an assumption they will do something sensible or regarding tobacco. Mm -hmm. It is clear that they won't. So it is, it is, uh, it is a weird, you might as well spin a coin. Will it be at the end of level two, at the end of level three, the beginning, halfway through level three? Uh, no, nobody is informed enough to predict what crazy uh, policymakers will do next. Mm. Uh, then finally, I want to say, you know, well, how can people get legal tobacco? I want to encourage civil disobedience. Mm. People should not bother. This is such a grotesque violation of human rights and liberty that it's precisely the same for older people like me who fought apartheid. Nobody says now we should have obeyed those stupid laws. Mm -hmm. And nobody should obey stupid laws now. Laws that hugely, dramatically, uh, uh, obnoxiously violate human rights should not be obeyed. Mm -hmm. For laws to be respected, they must be respectable. And these laws are not. Now, my advice to people is, you find some old receipt in your drawer or your jacket pocket or your, your uh, handbag or whatever from before the lockdown and you go around with this receipt and if anyone says when did you buy your cigarette and then you buy your cigarettes on the illicit market uh, go, go ahead and do that and it's easy to do and then when they say where did you get them you receipt how are they going to know whether that was a receipt for tobacco products or not if you can find a few old receipts that actually itemize it then what you do is you sell them on the receipt black market or the illicit market from receipts. There'll be a demand for that. Now, the other thing to understand is this is an anti-poor policy. Mm -hmm. Rich people go to supermarkets that might issue itemized receipts. Poor people, low-income people, that's the majority of South Africans, buy their cigarettes from spaza shops and tuck shops and street traders who do not have cash registers and do not issue and can't issue receipts. Uh, they should carry on doing that. They should actively support those people now dealing, unfortunately, in illicit tobacco. And when the lockdown is finished, the illicit tobacco market will have grown from a third to something like two thirds. The government seems to want this. Yep. The government is losing billions of rands in revenue. It's destroying thousands of jobs. It's completely uh, devastating all sorts of informal traders, spaza shops tuck shop owners, small informal businesses, people in rural villages and so on. Uh, this is devastating for many people and it's cruel, it's cruel to do this psychologically to people. So when will they stop? I, I, there's, the, it's still with us. It tells you that's, that they will do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they're so fanatically anti-tobacco, uh, meaning so fanatically anti-satisfaction. Mm -hmm anti-pleasure, anti-happiness, that, uh, you know, I think they will continue as long as they possibly can. They can't stand the thought that someone, someone somewhere might actually be happy. It's a horrible thought for these people. And so they will perpetuate it as long as they can. I encourage civil disobedience. I encourage protest. I encourage every journalist in the country to point out the madness of it. Uh, I encourage people to break this law. It is a violation of fundamental lifestyle choice, a, a violation of the right to human dignity, and no decent human being, no freedom-loving human being can condone it. Well, there we go, viewers and listeners. We can't give you the exact date of when you can buy legally again, but at least now you have some ideas of what you can do going forward. I think as we've tried to show in these podcasts with different guests, there are all sorts of things we as citizens can do to take back our civil liberties and freedoms that were suspended almost overnight uh, without any consultation, without any feedback from citizens, from the public, from the people to whom government is supposed to be accountable. 
Leon, I want to thank you very much for your time. Once again, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, to learn from you. Um, and I'm sure the viewers and the listeners enjoyed the episode as well. So all of you that are listening, um, as I mentioned before, if you gain value from the work that we do, please consider donating to the Free Market Foundation. We greatly appreciate your support, your views, your sharing the videos, and also your monetary support. It means a lot to us, especially during the epidemic, during the lockdown now. We greatly appreciate any uh, assistance that you could provide us. Uh, please remember that you can find all of our articles, media releases, and reports on our website on www.freemarketfoundation.com. Please also remember to follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. And please like the video, please share um, the video on your different social media channels, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. You can also find the podcast on different platforms, such as Google Podcasts and Spotify. Please subscribe there as well. For now, enjoy your World No Freedom Day as much as you can. Look forward to level three, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Bye.